Once we have an understanding of modal propositional logic, its semantics, syntax, and proof theory, we're in a position to ask whether it might be possible to extend modal propositional logic to other kinds of claims in English, claims that involve operators on the front of sentences. Some of the most interesting work since modal propositional logic was first developed involves such extensions. We will look here at three such extensions. The first one is an extension to cases where we have deontic operators. Deontic operators are operators such as it ought to be the case that, it is forbidden that, it is permissible that, the kind of language that we find in ethics in particular, but also in other deontic contexts. We also have temporal operators. It was the case that, it will be the case that, it is now the case that. Those are all temporal indicators talking about times. So perhaps there's a way of extending our understanding of boxes and diamonds to talk about these kinds of operators as well. Finally, there are epistemic operators, operators such as I believe that, you believe that, it is believed that, it is known that, I know that, you know that. Those all involve notions having to do with knowledge. I want to warn you, though, that the guiding principle here is we're still early in our understanding of these logics. So there are lots of places where it's not clear what we should say or what should be said. It's also clear in some cases that mistakes are being made, but in any case, it's interesting to see what future applications and further applications there can be for propositional modal logic. We begin then with deontic logic. Here we begin by introducing two operators, M and O. The first, we use for the notion of permission, characterized by the word may, and the second for the notion of obligation, ought. We now have two operators, M and O, which can be understood in terms of each other, in terms of dual rules. One of the most interesting features that prompted the development of alternatives, extensions to propositional modal logic is the fact that dual rules seem to play a role in other areas besides the relationship between universal and existential quantifiers and between boxes and diamonds understood in terms of necessity and possibility. We have a strong operator and a weak operator, and sometimes they can be defined in terms of each other. So here we get, suppose, it's, suppose that something is obligatory. It's obligatory, or it ought to be the case, that people are not murdered. Then it's not permissible that they're... murdered. So suppose something ought to be the case. It ought to be the case that uh, perhaps people are not murdered. In that case, it's not permissible that they're murdered. Or if you wish to avoid dropping the double negation, it's not permissible that it's not the case that they're not murdered. That's the same thing as it's not permissible that they're murdered. That makes deontic logic look like something that's off the ground and running, because that's where we began with possibility and necessity. We begin by doing interdefinability between the two using a dual rule, 
And then we try to explore further, what else should we say about boxes and diamonds? And we got a rather robust set of alternatives in place because of that. We can do the same thing here. We began thinking about deontic logic in the same way that we thought about boxes and diamonds understood in terms of necessity and possibility. The first thing to do is to think about the accessibility relation, and here we do so in normative terms. An accessible world is one in which what happens is permitted. And then we can derive that something is obligatory if and only if it happens in every permissible world. The question then becomes what restrictions seem appropriate for this accessibility relation. One thing that we want is seriality. That will allow us to validate the claim that anything obligatory is permissible. But we don't want reflexivity because if we had reflexivity, then we'd have to endorse that anything obligatory is actual, and it doesn't take much reflection to see that that's false. So we want seriality, we don't want reflexivity, what else do we want for deontic logic? A second extension is to epistemic logic, and here we introduce two operators, B and K, B for belief, K for knowledge. Sadly, these two are not interdefinable by a dual rule. The Greek word for belief is doxa, and epistemologists often talks about, talk about doxastic states so we might think of a logic for belief as a doxastic logic rather than an epistemic logic. In any case, the more interesting one is the epistemic logic that uses the K operator. So here we introduce a special symbol that will be the dual rule of the K operator. We take a diamond and we subscript a K to it to say this is a notion of epistemic possibility. So you might propose the following dual rule. It is known that phi, if and only if, it's not epistemically possible that not phi. Similarly, you could introduce a special notion of doxastic possibility. You believe phi if and only if it's false that it's doxastically possible that not phi. Once again, when we have these dual rules in place, we start thinking about the accessibility relation. An accessible world is one in which everything known is true or everything believed is true. I add a parenthetical note here concerning the last possibility. I'll give you a moment just to reflect on why that might be a vexed character in a way that the first notion isn't. If you figured out that there's something problematic about the second, as opposed to the first, congratulations. I think the primary difficulty for the second in comparison with the first is the first guarantees coherence, and hence the world in question will be a possible world. That's not true in the second case. Not everything believed is coherent. Not everything believed is consistent. So the worlds in question where we're talking about worlds where everything believed is true, might be impossible worlds. Nothing in our understanding of necessity and possibility introduced talk about impossible worlds. In fact, it looks like on standard assumptions there can be only one impossible world, because as soon as you get one inconsistency, you can generate any claim whatsoever in just a couple of steps. So once a world contains one inconsistency, it contains all of them. 
in which case there's only one impossible world. Call that the information explosion resulting from inconsistencies. If you're going to introduce a formal apparatus that relies on there being more than one impossible world, you have to find a way to control this information explosion. Otherwise, there will only be one relevant world. In any case, once we talk about which accessible worlds we're thinking about, the question is, what restrictions seem appropriate for this accessibility relation? This question was discussed first by Jaco Hintica in 1963 in a famous book called Knowledge and Belief. And it looks like some of the rules, some of the accessibility relations that we would want would be seriality and reflexivity for knowledge because we want to validate the inference from it's known that phi to it's epistemically possible that phi. You need seriality to do that. And we also want to validate the inference from it's known that phi to phi. That gets you reflexivity. We don't want either of these relations for belief, for our doxastic logic, however. So we have a rather impoverished doxastic logic at this point. We can't think of even one restriction that we want on the accessibility relation. For knowledge, for epistemic logic, however, these two restrictions on the accessibility relation look plausible. So we're a little bit further down the road in developing and understanding epistemic logic than we would be for doxastic. Our final extension is to temporal or tense logic. There are a couple of different ways to do this. Um, a natural one is to introduce four operators, G, H, F, and P. These operators go back to the work of Pryor in the 1950s, P-R-I-O-R. He's the father of tense logic. So G stands for, there's a typo here in the notes, so just pretend that word is not there. G stands for it is and always was going to be that. H stands for it is and always has been that. F stands for it either is or will at some point in the future be that. And P stands for it either is or was at some point in the past that. So F and P stand for future and past claims. G and H similarly stand for different parts of the temporal spectrum. You might also think that this reduces to two, but we aren't going to assume that for these purposes. The nice thing is that these operators are now interdefinable by a dual rule, two of them in fact. So H is interdefinable with P, F is interdefinable with G. It is and always was going to be that phi if and only if it's false that it either is or was at some point in the past that not phi, similarly for the F and G operators. In order to use Kripke frames for talking about temporal logic, we need to change from talking about sets of worlds to talking about sets of times, and then the question is how to constrain the accessibility relation between times. It's an interesting project to consider whether you can understand times in terms of worlds. Some people think you can, that you can define a time in terms of sets of worlds. If you could do that, then you'd have a closer connection between the logic for necessity and the logic for time. We won't assume that here, though. So we're asking, once we change the indices from worlds to times, what should the accessibility relation look like? Note the metaphysical implications here, though, about time. Eternalists think that all times are equal, but Arthur Pryor, 
the father of tense logics, isn't one of them. He thinks the future, for example, isn't real. Presentists have a different view than prior and the eternalists. Presentists, for example, think that the present moment is ontologically privileged. The only time that truly exists is the present. The past is merely what used to exist but doesn't anymore, and the future doesn't yet exist but will. Changing Kripke models so that we talk about sets of times rather than sets of worlds biases our logic against non-eternalism. Of course, it's always possible for a non-eternalist to try to construct the times that are not thought to be real from those that are thought to be real. So the project of constructing the set of times needed for doing a Kripke model here is a possibility. Perhaps the times for presentists, for example, perhaps past and future can be constructed in some way from the present, in which case you can introduce the set of times to include all of those and then just say what the construction is supposed to look like. There's a burden on presentists and other non-eternalists to do something like that anyway in order to defend their view. So maybe it's not that much of a bias against non-eternalism. But in any case, changing Kripke models in the way proposed looks like it appeals first and foremost to eternalists about time. Once we change in this way, the question again is what restrictions seem appropriate for this accessibility relation. The fundamental relation will be the at least as early as relation on the set of worlds. Clearly, we want transitivity. If time t is at least as early as time r, and that's at least as early as time s, then t is at least as early as time s. So we want transitivity. We don't want symmetry, but we also don't want anti-symmetry. So we want non-symmetry. We're just not committed to either symmetry or anti-symmetry between worlds, between conceived of as times, where the relation is at least as early as. We want non-reflexivity as well. We don't want to assume that every time is at least as early as itself. And we want some kind of connectivity claim so that we can show that every pair of times has either one earlier than, later than, or simultaneous with the other. And as soon as you introduce the languages of simultaneity, you're going to think about Einstein and the relativity of time, simultaneity, to a frame of reference. So maybe we have to have that as well. We thus have at least three extensions of modal propositional logic to other areas, and that makes the study of modal logic quite interesting because it can be extended to other areas when formal work is needed and understanding can be achieved for these other areas using the fundamental apparatus developed in propositional modal logic. Here we did time, knowledge, and obligation. And we learn some important insights into each of these areas from the fundamental work done in the 19, well, early part of the 1900s, all the way through 1960s when the semantics for, for quantified modal logic was developed. This completes our investigation of modal propositional logic. We turn in our next set of lectures to quantified modal logic.